Yeah, and I'm Becky Judd. I own HR Foundational Solutions. We handle HR compliance and employee relations for small and medium-sized businesses. So in short, we handle the icky and the sticky, the things employers don't know what to deal with or they don't know that it's coming. Um, a great example is the new overtime law that just recently came down. Employers are scrambling. They don't know what to do with it. That's okay. We've got solutions for employers. Um, Basically, we're gonna talk a little bit about onboarding your employees, just briefly, and the information you need to not only protect your employees, but to protect your company. Because as a small business owner, you need to protect your employees by protecting your company, by protecting your employees. It comes full circle. <laughs> we'll keep going. So, <laughs> got some great pictures here too. So, <laughs> um, basically, we're gonna talk about employee handbooks first. So I'll, I'll do my little, picture here while we're waiting for that to come up. So I've got five different skylines here, and I would love for anybody to tell me what the difference between the skylines are. We have Chicago, Minneapolis, Manhattan, Nashville, and Miami. I mean, they all look the same, right? They're nice big metro cities. They all have a lot of industries working for them. But in Nashville, you cannot catch a fish using a lasso. This is a true law, it's on the books. In Miami, up until 2010, swamp buggies, swamp buggies or authorized motor vehicles, which means they could be on any road in the entire city. And in Minneapolis, you cannot cross into St. Paul with a duck on your head. It's true law. I'm not making this up. I, I wouldn't know how to make it up, honestly. Um, while each city is unique in their laws, each company is unique in their policies, and that's why you need an employee handbook. An employee handbook literally is your playbook for your company. It talks about you know, your absenteeism policy. What are you gonna do if somebody doesn't show up three days in a row? What are your benefits? What legal obligations do you have to offer them family and medical leave? These vary by not only federal law for the size of your company, but state law and local laws. An example of local law is the paid sick leave that's going into play in July of 2017. A state law, you have to offer paid parental leave, or I'm sorry, unpaid parental leave for employees 21 or greater, whereas the federal law is 50 or greater. Some companies just don't know that. They think that they have to adhere to FMLA only if they have 50 or more employees. State law says otherwise. This is why I encourage every company to have an employee handbook, not only for the fact that it protects your company, it protects you, it protects your employees. You know what the story is. You know what you do when you're going into that game. Different policies are very, very important. An accountant company is not gonna have the same policy as a manufacturing company when it comes to absenteeism, sick leave, paid time off, all the benefits that you could offer to your company. Your employees, this sets the expectations for your employees. It also sets the consequences if they do not adhere to those expectations. All employees should be treated equally. The rules are the same for all of them. Update the employee handbook annually. Don't just let it sit there from 2010 or you're gonna have a swamp buggy on the road. So please don't do that. If you think of that every year, you can think of, okay, well, I think this policy was working really well for my company, but I wanna update it. I wanna retool it. I wanna make it a little bit stronger. There's also federal laws, state laws, local laws that change every year. If it's not in, employee, in your employee handbook and you have to go to court for wrongful termination, there's a very good chance you're not gonna win. So while an employee handbook is not enforceable in a court of law, Having that documentation is a good faith effort and there's more likely the judgment's gonna err on your side. Yay, I'm here. <laughs> now go show them those pictures, those are just cute. Look at those pictures. <laughs> so I bet if I asked you to, you couldn't pick up Minneapolis, huh? Oh, come on. <laughs> Minneapolis, it's the great one right in the middle because we are one of the best cities, let's face it. So. Just covering up on the employee handbook again, be sure to update that annually and ensure that all employees sign it upon hire and when you make any updates, whether it's a one page update or an update to the entire handbook. 70% of sexual or other harassment cases go unreported in the workplace. That's a staggering number. Now is one of these workplaces yours. I can tell you at least 10 of my clients have had at least one sexual harassment case that's been reported to me when I investigated it, I found five more that went unreported. That's scary. And the business owners were completely oblivious. They thought, there's no way this could be going on in my organization. Yeah, wanna bet? I don't, it's, it's a horrible statistic. 
and sexual harassment is something that's definitely prevalent. But it's not just stopping at sexual harassment, it's stopping at other harassment. So in every company, you should have a sexual and anti-harassment policy. Zero tolerance policy. Do not make it optional. Put it in place for your company, even if you think you're, there's nothing going on. I would love to have a client where there's nothing going on. It would probably be my easiest client ever. Make it a zero tolerance policy. It's not acceptable. There's no way, no how, harassment should be acceptable in a company. It creates a hostile work environment, which leads to the absenteeism, which leads to you know, higher medical costs that Greg talked about. It really does trickle down. It's bullying. It's not you know, one gender to the other. It's same gender. It's bullying. Um, if you've ever walked into an all-female workplace, you can see a lot of it. It's kind of staggering. Men are just as bad, though. I'm not playing favorites. They're both just equally bad. You have the this for that. It doesn't always happen between a supervisor and employee. It can happen between peer to peer. And the employee always feels like their job is on the line and they can't say no. This creates bad, hostile work environment. Your employee engagement's down, the employee doesn't want to come to work, and they're just hanging out until you fire them or until they find something better. That's not going to create a very successful business anywhere. Make sure it's written. It has to be written. Make sure the employee understands it. You've gone through it with the employee during the onboarding process. Set the you know, consequences for the policy, and make sure they sign off on it. You know, that shows that they acknowledge the policy, that you've talked to them about it, and they know what's going to happen if they do it. Also, it's important to have in that policy that you will not retaliate. The company will not retaliate against any employee for good faith reporting efforts. Because that's, if you have that in there, more people are going to come forward. You don't have to be the victim or the accuser. You can stand by and you can see it, and you can report it. And action will be taken. If I have a client that, uh, says they don't want to put that in there, they're no longer my client. I feel that strongly about that policy. Here's a cautionary tale. I think we've all heard the sad story of Penn State and what happened. And overarching was not the actual actions that happened. It's what Penn State did in response to it. They stuck their head in the stand. And that's what is continuing to go to this day. There's still lawsuits about that. So this is where our progressive discipline policy comes into play. You have the handbook, you have your expectations. The employees have gone through those expectations with a bulldozer. Now what do you do? You have to discipline them. You have to have consequences for your policy violation. That should be policy with a Y, sorry. Uh, not only does this improve employee performance, but it encourages success for your top 20% of your performers. They recognize that you know they're here working every day, they're working hard, yet these employees are getting away with you know, breaking policy. It demonstrates to them that as a company, you will not tolerate that. There will be consequences. These performers are going to work harder. Otherwise, you know, they're going to leave and go to another company that's going to benefit from that's going to reward them. You also have a documentation trail. That's really important that we have a documentation trail. A lot of employers say, okay, well, this person has, you know, been breaking, you know, the absenteeism rule. They haven't shown up in three days. They don't call. They, they leave early. You know, they're stealing money from the safe. That's great, but if you don't have it documented, how are you gonna terminate them? Employment at will is not always employment at will. They can go and say, well, he wrongfully terminated me, he can't prove I stole anything, he never talked to me about it. Very hard case to win. So always make sure there's a documentation trail. It's tedious, it's annoying, you have to write everything down, but trust me, in the end, it really helps out. You have to know what you can prove and what you can't prove, and the documentation trail really helps with that. Again, it also protects employees' employers. It protects employers from employees that are not behaving up to standards, and it protects employees from employers that choose to abuse employees, because they do. They're out there, it's unfortunate, but this also helps both sides. So it's not just all about the employer. We don't want to reward bad behavior. I hate seeing bad behavior rewarded. Somebody comes in late, oh, it's okay, you know, they do so well, they're a top salesperson. They can come in late all the time, it's fine. Is it? Is it really fine? I don't think so. It's costing you money. All right. Big fan of Dilbert being in HR. And uh, for those of you that can't see, somebody is buried in a pile of paperwork upside down. And I did uh, have a run a stint in ergonomics where I had to do desk assessments. So employee paperwork should not be sitting on your desk. There's a myriad of confidential information in personnel files, which is another basic every company needs to have. You need to have not just the employee file. You need to have an I-9 file. You need to have a medical file. 
you need to have a payroll information file. So having one employee file and throwing everything into it is not best practice. It, the employee has a right to request their personnel file from a company in writing. Well, you don't want to have all that other information in there. It's just not safe, it's not smart. Also, if the government comes in and audits you for medical information, you get an I-9 audit from the Department of Homeland Security, you don't want to have all that other information in there because if they see something that shouldn't be done, it's not quite being done right, they're going to bring in other government departments and you really don't want that. They're going to tie you up for weeks. So, in your basic employee information file, you want the resume, job description, um, and the employee acknowledgments, employee handbook, sexual harassment acknowledgments, any training they've had, signed off on that, any disciplinary action, I would recommend putting that in there. Any commendations, any you know, great letters of customer success from other managers, I really appreciate that. Putting that there, there as well. It's not all about the bad stuff. What not to include, Form I-9. Those should be in a separate file completely. Not for each individual employee, put all your employee, active employees in one. Health and medical information, separate file for each employee. There's protected medical information governed by HIPAA. Can't just be accessed by anybody. Payroll information, I'm sure Bernie will talk a little bit about that, but you want your payroll information in there, including direct deposit forms, W-9 information, anything that revolves around payroll that could be protected, you want that in something else. I know if I had a situation where I had to go search somebody's personnel file, I don't really want to see their direct deposit number. That could be dangerous. That could be come back at me and say, well, you had access to this. Then we have a breach of security. Um, it's amazing what courts will reach out for. Make sure every single file that's listed right there is locked, secured, and only accessible to those that absolutely need it. Two most important things, consistency and documentation. These will be your best friends. They will save you. They are equally important. In everything in HR, apply the same actions to all employees. Do not treat your top salesperson any different than you would treat the host at a restaurant because they're not different in the eyes of the law. They are the, equally the same. I don't care if your top salesperson's bringing in a million dollars and your host is just there five hours a week. If the top salesperson is breaking the policies, discipline them the same way you would the host. That's what the courts are going to look at. Fair and equal treatment, most importantly. Failure to document. Please don't fail to document. You need a paper trail. You need a paper trail that is objective, clear, and consistent that shows the actions you took to discipline the person as well as the steps that you needed to wrap it up. I had somebody that um, had, unfortunately, they had a great drug policy. It was a child care center, but they had a three strikes and you're out rule. So they had this three strikes where, so, well, you can come to work high apparently twice, but the third time you're going to be terminated. It goes back to the, terminate, the progressive discipline policy. You can terminate instantly if you have cause, but they didn't document the first two times. So the employee was terminated when they came to, high, came to work high on the third time. They took them to court for wrongful termination. The first two strikes weren't documented. Guess what? That employee won. Right or wrong, that employee won because they didn't document it. So make sure that your consistency and documentation equal, fair, objective. Don't put your opinion into it because your opinion does not matter. Unfortunately, unlike Greg and Cindy, I bring a lot of bad news of what not to do. But trust me, at the end of the day, you're pretty glad to have it when you get hauled into court on a wrongful termination suit. Again, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll definitely be here after the presentation. And Bernie, I believe you're next. Thank you very much.